One thing, I'm not technically a founder of Klimadao. I joined like a month before launch, but I am a contributor. I've been working on it full time for a couple years now. Um, so Simon gave a, gave a great overview of the broader scope of the problem of sustainability beyond carbon. Um, but the scope of the carbon problem is quite large. Um, we've emitted about two trillion tons of carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution. And the mechanisms that we have today and the scale of commitments that have been made to date are still quite small relative to the scope of that problem. Um, the other thing I want to point out about what I'm about to discuss is that these mechanisms that we're designing to scale the carbon markets can very much apply to other environmental benefit assets. Um, and I'm part of a group called the Environmental Benefits Framework Activator that is developing that framework for expanding beyond just carbon. Um, but I really want to focus on some lessons that we can draw from the history of the carbon markets and from uh, the climate Dow's journey that we've been on trying to scale up those markets uh, that hopefully will be able to be applied to these other impact markets that are still very small um, and, and quite nascent, but, but growing and, and very important. So why does decentralization matter for climate action? Um, the platforms that we've heard a lot about, um, you know, Handprint as, as an example, are, are centralized traditional companies that are being run from the top down as, as corporations. Um, but Web3 promises to use decentralization to achieve some of the goals that centralized uh, top down corporations struggle with. Um, so I'm going to cover a few, a few ideas there uh, relevant to carbon. So there's three different topics I want to uh, discuss. One is disintermediation, supporting new projects, as well as interoperability. There's some fancy terms there, but I'll try to break it down in very simple language. So the first is disintermediation. The basic concept of disintermediation is that you're going to more directly connect a buyer with a seller so that more of the money that the buyer puts into the system actually gets to the person producing that product. Before I get there, I need to give a little bit of background of how the carbon market works. Um, so we're going to get into some detail here. Um, hopefully it's clear. So like any other commodity, like say a piece of fruit, um, there's a producer and there's a consumer, or a supply side and a demand side. And this diagram gives you an overview of the basic structure of the carbon markets as they've existed since the 90s, since the Kyoto Protocol. On the top of the diagram is the supply side. This is where projects are going to go out and take some positive action, like planting trees or installing solar panels, that has a positive impact by either avoiding carbon emissions in the first place or removing carbon emissions that have already gone up into the atmosphere. So at the top right, we have the project developer. They're the ones on the ground doing the work. However, they need to carry out the work according to an accepted methodology, i.e. a set of scientifically rigorous steps that ensures that the actions they take actually have the intended effect. And those methodologies are published by what are called registries. Uh, some examples include Vera and Gold Standard. Those are the leaders right now. But there's lots of other registries uh, that have come up. And uh, the role of the registry is really to set a bar for what a good carbon credit looks like, and also to approve a list of VVBs, or validation and verification bodies. The VVB's job is to check the work of the project developer and make sure that they actually followed out the methodology as, um, as planned. Um, so they, they provide that check and balance, the auditing function within the supply side of the market. So once your project developer has adopted a methodology, gone and carried out the work, registered with a registry like Vera or Gold Standard. The VVB comes in, checks the work, and then the registry issues the, the credits once the VVB files their report. Then we transition, upon issuance, we transition from the supply side to the demand side, where an end user is going to use that carbon credit to actually make a claim, saying I'm carbon neutral or I'm supporting sustainable initiatives. Um, and currently, that market is very highly intermediated. There's a set of financial actors, brokers, traders, retailers, that sit in between the end buyer who wants to support climate action and the projects that are carrying out that climate action. And the goal of disintermediation um, is really focused on this bottom side of the, of the market, the demand side of the market. A simple example just to get a clear sense of what disintermediation is all about. So in a simple commodity market, like say for a piece of fruit, the farmer produces the product, they sell it to a wholesaler, the wholesaler then sells it to a grocery store, and then you as the consumer walk into the grocery store, buy the apple, and you eat it. So the flow of goods um, flows down from the farmer through several intermediaries, and finally to the end consumer. You compare this with a farmer's market, um, which is a disintermediated market for, say, fruit or vegetable. Um, you are going to the farmer directly. They're standing there at the stand. You buy the product directly from them, and nearly 100% of the money that you put into the farmer's hand goes to them. Maybe they pay a, a small fee to the farmer's market for the right to have a, a stall there. 
Um, this is a disintermediated market for a simple commodity like fruits or vegetables. So the idea behind disintermediation that um, some of this technology I'm about to discuss gives us is to more directly connect the end user with the source of supply. And there are three ways that blockchain technology enables us to do this. I mentioned earlier in the panel that when you're buying carbon credits in the traditional market, you're often going through a broker. And that broker takes calls over the phone, you go back and forth over email, and settle the transaction usually with a wire transfer. This process takes three to six weeks in the traditional carbon market, but with on-chain technology, with blockchain, you can settle that transaction in as little as a few seconds using a credit card or even using a Web3 wallet if you're onboarded. So you get nearly instant purchases compared with a lengthy sourcing process uh, when you move on-chain. In addition, the market for off-chain credits is highly fragmented. There are hundreds of different brokers, different marketplaces where you might go to purchase this credit, um, and so you need to search around quite a lot. And the fees for these uh, marketplaces and brokers typically are in the range of 25, 50, 100 percent fees, i.e. a broker might charge you double the price that they originally paid for that credit when they sell it on to you. Whereas when you move on chain, we can use things like automated market makers to create a liquid market where everyone sees exactly what the price is at any given time. And when you buy, you know the price you're going to pay before you actually place the order. Uh, and you don't have to shop around to a bunch of different uh, providers. In addition, the fees for on-chain transactions can be as low as a few percentage points. Um, and, and that's really dramatically lower than what you would see with an off-chain broker. Finally, when you're transacting on chain, there's a permanent public record of the transaction stored permanently on the blockchain where you transact. This is as compared with an over-the-counter trade with a broker where you, know, you called them over the phone, there's an email record, but unless you're on that email chain, nobody really knows what price you paid. And so it's very hard for project developers to have negotiating power with their financers and their off-takers to say, this is what I know people are paying for credits like the ones I'm producing. Um, and also, when on the buyer side, it's hard to give confidence to your customers that you actually did what you said you were going to do, you met your sustainability pledge, if all you have to show for it is a PDF. Instead, the vision for on-chain carbon that, that we've implemented at KlimaDAO is to have a permanent, transparent record that you can share on your social media, that you can embed on your website, and you can see it right there in line uh, with a permanent transaction hash that uniquely identifies your retirement activity. So it's fully transparent as opposed to the highly opaque off-chain market. Uh, so just as an example, we built this product called CarbonMark that is the, the Web3 marketplace, the universal carbon marketplace um, on blockchain. And you can go on there today. We've got 20 million credits from 180 different projects. Um, we've traded over 4 billion in volume to date. And uh, these are examples of some of the projects. Uh, these particular projects all come from the Vera registry, uh, but we're in the process of onboarding additional projects that come from Web3 native registries as well. So that's the concept of disintermediation, directly connecting the supply with the demand, lowering fees, and getting greater transparency and access. The second point is around supporting new projects. So the projects I just showed you on CarbonMark, those credits have already been issued. The project was implemented, they were verified by a VVB, and the registry already issued the credits. But new projects need to get financing to get off the ground. And this is another area where, dis where uh, decentralization can play a role. Uh, so this is around uh, the sort of middle section of the market where a project developer gets financing and then offloads their credits uh, into the market. So there's a lot of different types of carbon credit projects. Um, there's dozens of different methodologies ranging from planting trees, installing solar panels, switching to more efficient cook stoves. And each of these projects has different risk parameters uh, as well as different costs to implement. But the one thing they all share in common is a high upfront capital requirement. They need hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to actually get off the ground and go take the action that's gonna generate the carbon credits. And so they need financing to do that. And Typically, these projects are financed through backroom deals where they interact with a financier or a large company that provides the capital, uh, usually in private. And then once the deal is signed, they go and they do a press release. Uh, so you may have seen recently uh, Heirloom have received a large purchase from, from Microsoft. Uh, but this deal was negotiated in private. And we just found out after the fact that Microsoft had decided to make this, uh, this investment. What KlimaDAO is trying to do, uh, what we have done, is built an open public governance process where projects can approach the DAO for funding uh, via our governance forum. And there's an example I'm going to walk through here of a recent uh, example of that. 
So there's a group called LimeNet that is developing a new methodology using uh, basically crushed limestone to store carbon dioxide in carbonate ions uh, in the sea. So the idea is you crush up limestone uh, through an industrial process, you distribute that limestone into the ocean, and it has two effects. Uh, it buffers the ocean's acidity, so it absorbs carbon dioxide that's already been dissolved into the ocean, uh, and it also um, it allows for uh, um, it allows for calcium-based life forms, uh, like shellfish, to uh, resist the acidification of the ocean. So as the ocean absorbs more carbon dioxide, it becomes more acidic, and that dissolves the shells of these, uh, these calcium-containing organisms, like shellfish. Um, and so this Alignet's methodology has these, uh, these benefits of sequestering carbon and, uh, and protecting shellfish. And LimeNet came to Klimadao through our public governance process on forum klimadao.finance, um, and they requested funding for their, uh, their first project. Um, so this is still ongoing uh, on our governance forum. If you want to get involved, uh, feel free to go and check it out. Uh, and this is just one of several projects that Klimadao uh, has evaluated through our public governance process. And, and the key here, I want to emphasize why decentralization is so beneficial for this, um, this part of the life cycle, supporting new projects, is that this is all happening in public. So everyone can see what questions are being asked by the community, can diligence the project themselves, and can see that Klimadao is assessing this project according to a certain framework that we've put out. Um, this gives a lot more confidence to secondary buyers and to other funders to know what kinds of questions should I ask if a project like LimeNet's uh, Ocean Alkalinity Enhancement comes to me for funding, what kinds of questions should I be asking? So we've also funded two other projects through this mechanism, uh, including a cook stove project in Bangladesh uh, with our partner StarCB uh, for 250,000 USD um, doing improved cook stoves. So we're helping refugees in a Bangladeshi uh, refugee, refugee camp to reduce the emissions associated with their cooking. Uh, and we also distributed 227,000 USD uh, to a reforestation project in Africa that is uh, restoring a degraded forest preserve. So that's the idea of supporting new projects with a decentralized governance process, increases the transparency of the vetting process, and gives other financers something to look to uh, when they're going through the vetting process for their own projects. Finally, interoperability. Um, this was mentioned in the panel earlier, but there's a proliferation of different uh, carbon credit standards, different mechanisms for uh, interacting with the carbon markets, as well as other environmental assets that are coming online, which add another level of complexity. Uh, so this issue really affects the entire market, um, and it's important that as this complexity increases, we have mechanisms for simplifying that complexity so the end user doesn't get completely overwhelmed. Just to give you a very uh, concrete example of how insane this whole market has gotten, um, there are now hundreds, thousands of different organizations operating across the value uh, spectrum, the value chain from the buy side to the supply side, and the goal of interoperability is to reduce some of this complexity. An analogy. When you're traveling, you probably have dozens of different cable types. If you're going to different countries, you have to deal with different outlets. The idea of interoperability is to create a universal adapter so that rather than having to deal with all the different plugs, you have one adapter that you can travel with and you know that any plug that you encounter will work with this adapter. And so Klimadao is building an interoperable ecosystem where no matter where the credit was issued from, no matter what type of asset it is, the buyer has the same experience of going onto a website, putting in their payment information, and getting that permanent verifiable record. So just to review, there are three key benefits of decentralization that I've highlighted today. One is around disintermediation, which ensures that more of the money gets to the people on the ground doing the work. The second is to is for communities to publicly support projects, which gives a signal to buyers about what kinds of questions to ask, and also ensures um, that those funding requests are vetted properly by a community in public. And finally, interoperability simplifies a very complex space that is only growing in complexity. So if you want to get in touch, find out more, feel free to reach out, uh, marcus at klimadao.finance. Um, you can find the slides from today's presentation at that link. It's great to be with you here.